Watney, uh -oh. your uh, uh -oh. your Zoom name is still Watney of BTP. Not that it matters. Yeah, that doesn't show up. And yeah, I'm sure the stream as I like, cut into that conversation is like, what are they on about? Don't worry, stream. It's nothing important. Anyways, hi, stream. <laughs> Uh, this is Season 2, Episode 7 of Star Trek Fenrir, and if you're not familiar, uh, Fenrir is a tabletop role-playing game that uses the Star Trek Adventures rule set. We are specifically set in the year 2411 aboard a Cerberus class that is following in the footsteps of the USS Ophion. You don't need to have watched Ophion to enjoy the game, but you're going to catch some references and nods if you do. Uh, you can find the VODs for both Fenrir and Ophion on my YouTube and most of the popular podcast solutions. Uh, this week, I've got three announcements. The first is that my newest game, Star Trek Matahari, actually started streaming this past Saturday. They are an every other week game, and if you're interested in them, you can catch the VODs, same places as everything else. Announcement two is that I am trying to spin up a new Star Trek Adventures game on Friday that is set in the original series era. It is called Star Trek Gangut, and the player applications can be found pinned on my Twitter. So if you're interested in that, and if you're in a Euro-friendly time, or maybe you're just bored during quarantine, send me an application and we'll chat. Final announcement I have is that I've started work on a comprehensive Andromeda Galaxy supplement. I've sort of done a little bit of that work when I released the original Andromeda Mission Compendium, but now I've actually gone through and I've done all the planets, all the species, etc., etc. So look forward to seeing that. And if you're a patron of mine, you can actually suggest cameo appearances of planets, alien species, and pretty much almost anything, because i got to give my patrons something, some benefit. So uh, Only other thing I have to say before we do introductions is that, as usual, uh, I usually love the support you provide for the stream whatever it is even if you are an anonymous bit bomber i will find you one day but with that said let's go ahead and have uh, everyone do introductions as per usual so uh, we'll start with john hello everybody uh my name is john i play rast half romulan half betazoid uh, uh xo of the fenrir and i am in seattle washington and you can find me at uh chubby kobold gaming pretty much anywhere mr Matic. Uh, my name is James. I play Commander Maddock, the chief engineer, um, typically involved in all the temporal bullshit that happens. Uh, find me at the Twitter handle above my head on the Twitch, which is VikingRed94. Um, past that, I got nothing. Got nothing. Watney, what do you got? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm Watney. I play Commodore Bri Archuleta, um, and... The Denobulan Doctor LL, and you can find me on Twitter at Doc Watney. And Dag, I play the Vulcan holographic science officer Vassar, and some of you might know me as Zeke, but I don't have my Goran mask with me today. Uh, I live <laughs> in Sacramento, California, and you can find me on Twitter at Trek Nexus. Williams. Hey guys, uh, I'm Aaron. I play Commander R.J. Williams, a human male tactical officer, uh, and I also play a certain Ensign Jensen, the hypochondriac. Uh, you can catch me across all socials at Panorama Tint, and that's that's all for me. Oh, I'm in Prince Edward Island, Canada. And last but not least, Matthew. Uh, I'm Matthew. I play Lieutenant Commander Lee Tobin. He is a Bajoran science officer who joined Starfleet as a kind of act of religious devotion following after the path of the emissary, Ben Sisko. All right. And with that, let's go ahead and run the intro.
able to Picard brand salt? <laughs> no, no, we're not going to do Picard brand salt. Not on stream. All right, and we're back. Hi, stream. So usually here I have a captain's log going on, but I thought since we did take a week off that I would handle it myself. So kind of to catch you up to speed, if this is your first session with us or if you're coming back, the USS Fenrir and her crew have journeyed to the Andromeda Galaxy via Pandora's Gate. And I have a jet flying overhead, so one moment. It's always when I start the monologue, and that's the most annoying part. It's, it's, anyway, so, yes, the Fender has gone to the Andromeda Galaxy via Pandora's Gate to receive repairs and prepare for a possible confrontation with the Shan. What they didn't expect to find was a graveyard of planet killers, and much less an intact universe class under the command of one Admiral Beckett. Pretty much... All of the Fenrir's crew has taken the chance to wander the USS Leviathan or examine the planet killers in detail. And part of that process is the senior staff are working on ways to maybe try and counteract Maddox developing temporal psychosis. So I thought it would be interesting if we started today's session with us all gathering in the conference room, as one does in Star Trek, and talking a little bit about uh, what you've been spending your time doing while the Fenrir is being repaired. Uh, I've given my players uh, significant handouts, and they're pretty much going to run this and see what happens. So take it away. Ray will look around the room and be like, oh, it's nice to see all your faces again. Did you all enjoy your mini shore leave? It was fantastic. I got as detailed scans as I could on all 50 of those planet killers. Broken kinetic force. What What could do that? The holes are almost solid neutronium. And yet they were broken like they were nothing. Like a stick. It's exactly, exactly like a stick. Stick that's thousands of meters long, hundreds of meters wide, and made out of neutronium. Commander Lee, I'm surprised you didn't take the opportunity to come with me and Williams out to uh, see the planet killers. Well, Captain, uh, I was actually far more interested in the medical facilities on board uh, oh. one of these universe class vessels. Leviathan's technology is so far in advance of any of the genetronic replicator specs that we've developed. I mean, they can clone neural tissue to a degree that, I mean, it would almost render obsolete any kind of artificial limbs or organs that the Federation has developed up until this point in time. And quite frankly, I, I felt that I owed it to Commander Maddock to review their coaxial warp drive. They've managed to identify all the various different uh, complexities and failures of prior designs or proposed designs that the Daystrom Institute has devised. It's, it's truly a stunning achievement. I see. Um, Bree will look down the table at Lieutenant Zero. Zero, how did you spend your time while we were being repaired? I was able to go with uh, Zeke and we were able to check out the engineering aspects. Um, it's interesting to see that most of the advances that Starfleet has done came from this ship. The interesting thing is the coaxial warp drive, however, um, with QSD, it base it the way that QSD works and the way that it lengthens the ship and shortens uh, space in order for us to travel at a much quicker speed. Coaxial warp drive literally takes this takes a uh, takes the space between us and our destination, folds it, allows us to pass through, and then opens up again. Um, in theory, it could take you. 30 seconds to reach Vulcan from Earth. Uh, it's 
something that definitely is of special note and should really be studied to see if it could be readjusted to fit more modern uh more modern applications oh yeah um did has does anyone have reports on how the repairs went anything i need to make note of Well, Beckett, would you have uh, told the Commodore yet, or? Please say no, because she just asked about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, because I, I, I like surprises. Okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I'll touch base with the Admiral on that one. So I think um, we need to maybe address the elephant in the room. Commander Maddock. As I'm sure you all know, he is, by now, he's suffering from temporal psychosis caused by too many trips through time. And while we can, you know, as Commander Lee mentioned, help him with the um, his arm and that procedure. I'm not sure that we can find a solution for the psychosis that he has. And unless anyone has suggestions now to try, my recommendation is going to be to allow him to remain on the universe class since they have such advanced technology. Question to Mike. Mm -hmm. In Vassar's research aboard the Leviathan, would he have found uh, treatments for temporal psychosis? It is not something they address. Like it's, I'm trying to figure out how to put this. So when you pick up a book like Grey's Anatomy, it starts very bland, goes over literally all the joinings of the bones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You're seeing temporal stuff like that, where it's okay if you travel this part through time, this is what happens to it. But when it comes to temporal psychosis, there is no cure as far as you're seeing. It is a problem that is, for lack of a better way to put it, it is lacking a solution. Apologies, Commodore, but even aboard the Leviathan's advanced facilities, there is no cure for temporal psychosis. I believe even here, uh, the doctors aboard would only be able to keep Maddox comfortable as he endures the condition. And I'm sure the Admiral would enjoy having extra time with Maddock. I would also like to suggest, Lieutenant Commander, although I agree, it seems clear that there is no course of treatment that has as yet been devised using this technology. It may be that a confluence or holistic approach using the various different means that they have available, including the advanced neural genotronic replicators, um, Vulcan telepathy, or some other form of uh, telepathy that could you use to uh, hold together an individual's consciousness and the use of the advanced uh, chronometric sensors on board a vessel such as this, they might be able to bring these technologies together in such a way as to help to treat medic. We don't have a cure as of yet, as you noted, but we don't have access to any of those technologies and we, we might be best if we left medic in their care. Interesting proposal, Lieutenant Commander. I was just going to propose something up your alley. Perhaps once we deal with the Shan back in the Milky Way galaxy, perhaps we can find a Bajoran orb and your prophets may be able to help Commander Matic. Hmm. The prophets are sometimes rather mercurial. Um, I know that they have the best interests of Bajor, and I believe the Federation as a whole at heart, but individuals can sometimes be sacrificed to the grand plan for the betterment of, well, the entire Federation or the entire world of Bajor. Well, as Maddox's current commanding officer, I feel much more comfortable recommending him to the uh this universe class then oh okay wait 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 
out of character. Where is the Fenrir right now? You're still inside the Leviathan's okay. hangar bay. Okay. I feel much more comfortable um, leaving Maddox in the hands of the crew of this ship. It is ultimately his choice, but I will, of course, you know, along with uh, Savia's discussion, allow them to make the best decision for them. And on that note, you actually get a hail coming from Mr. Beckett, Admiral Beckett, specifically for you, Archuleta. Hmm. Uh, this is Bree. Go ahead. Commodore, uh, if you could join me outside of your ship in the docking bay, I have kind of a surprise for you. All right, I'll be right there. You all are dismissed. She will go outside. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Welcome to USS Fenrir uh, Charades <laughs> Edition. Yeah, where, you know, the, the audio listeners are like, what the hell's going on? If you don't know me already, what you should know is that I literally have a naval base about a mile and a half that way, and apparently tonight is when they're going to buzz my house, so I might be a little bit more quiet than usual. Anyways, uh, with the meeting adjourned, uh, Miss Archuleta uh, does decide to meet Admiral Beckett out in the hangar bay, and uh, I don't think I've shown this map before, but there is a Miranda for scale. So if you're ever curious how large a universe is, you now know. Uh, but my question is to Archuleta, would you bring Maddox with you for this meeting? Or is that something you would resolve later? I mean, if she knows the nature of the meeting, she would, but she wouldn't bring him randomly. Okay. Uh, then in that case, we'll just say that you walk out of the umbilical between the Fenrir and the Leviathan and waiting for you is Admiral Beckett. I assume, Mr. Beckett, you have quite a number of gifts with you. Uh, yeah, of course, always. Um, uh, definitely more alcohol. Uh, if if anybody uh, has watched Ophion, Amalthea, or anything else that Beckett has been involved in, um, he is a brewer. He likes making beer, um, which if you've been around long enough for Ophion, all started because of a joke of a still, a moonshine still that was on the L car for the original um, uh, uh, Prometheus class ship that we had found. Mm -hmm. So I took the joke and ran with it. But um, he will be standing there with alcohol of all types, uh, having probably found out the senior staff's favorite drinks you know one way or another um but he also has a pad in his hand and isn't i wouldn't say uh, uh impatient but is waiting uh brie will approach him and kind of what how is the alcohol like displayed is it it's probably on, uh, I would say, uh, well, okay, because ELH is probably going to make me anyways. It's probably on a golf cart. Mm -hmm. um, Just the entire back of a golf cart. Um, yeah, pretty much. And Beckett is just annoyingly leaning on the golf cart like he hates the golf carts. Oh. <laughs> uh, Brie kind of uh, runs her hand over the front of it. And she's like, oh, you travel in style, Admiral. I hate it. I really hate it. But uh, it is one of the easiest ways to get from point A to point B, other than using site to site uh, transporting, which um, no surprise, the ship is completely full of transporter stations and bays everywhere. Um, but beyond the gifts, um, to keep your crew um, well liquored up, um, 
I have another little surprise that is something that we were working on for a Prometheus class for obvious reasons. Um, another ship that has MVAM. Right. Just like your Cerberus has MVAM. Well, thanks to you. Well, we, now it does. We, we now have a choice. <laughs> uh, so. Correct. Um, I would say your ship is whole and in one piece, but that would be a, um, a slight on the fact that it can turn into three pieces <laughs> and continue to fly. Um, but there was a new system that we had been working on um, that was actually from an idea uh, started way back in the Ophion days and actually from what we could tell by some information given to me by a certain mutual friend of ours from the Daystrom Institute uh, was supposed to be added to all ships that have MVAM or at least ones that would be acting as a frontline ship as Starfleet doesn't like using the word battleship. Um, they are called high energy plasma expulsors. Now that's a really big word or set of words that basically just means when you enter MVAM, your ship will um, vent high energy plasma. So if any ships um, are close enough that when you enter MVAM, it will do a serious amount of damage to them. Ooh. But they have to be close enough for it to work, obviously. Now, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I've never ripped a ship in three pieces, even with MVAM at close range on purpose. But uh, it's still a nasty little trick to have in your back pocket. Right. And it's, like, uh, it's like having a shotgun. It's exactly. <laughs> it is literally like being the bartender who's the most <laughs> dangerous person in the bar because they're the ones with the 12 gauge behind the counter. Hmm. And there's um, no risk to Fenrir. Right? Um, no. Uh, we have also added in, um, we've helped with the dermal plating of your ship to be able to, let's say, resist the effect that happens. All right. Um, is, is the information on the pad? The information is on the pad. Um, I had also, um, again, uh, I guess Admiral's prerogative to look in on my old friend um, and seeing the issues that Maddox is going through. Yes. I was meaning to talk to you about that. Well, we can either do it now or if you'd rather uh, command staff, whatever you want. I am free. It's, it's kind of nice having like four captains on the same ship at the same time. I can literally walk away and do whatever I want and not have to worry about, you know, um, well, other than chirps, but. Just ride around in your golf cart. Uh, don't, don't make me have this thing ripped off your ship, please. Okay, okay. Um, uh, yeah. So back to Matic. We, all things considered, I think, and, you know, I regret to tell you this, but I think he may be better served staying with you all. Uh, you are aware of his condition, right? I, I am aware, aware of the temporal psychosis and the advanced stages of it. Um, it's not something that we are unfamiliar with here. Um, as I'm sure your doctors have told you, there really isn't a cure per se. Um, basically, the best you can hope for is to treat it and make the person comfortable. Um, I know this firsthand, um, as I said, and I do mean firsthand, uh, I suffer from a very slight version of temporal psychosis, um, with a little bit of temporal narco, 
temporal narcosis as well. Um, for reasons that I can't really, well, the main reason I can't really tell you about, but, and he'll kind of look around and seeing that nobody's actively paying attention. In case you haven't already guessed, this ship is not from this time period. Really? <laughs> Shocking. I know, right? Um, the ship itself it gives off a certain type of chroniton radiation. It's very, very minor. You don't have to worry about any of your crew having any problems with it. If anything, I know it has helped mine and as well as the other members of the multitude of crews that I have to worry about who have gone through this. Um, as you well know, being a member of a Starfleet crew, you happen to go on a whole lot of wild and crazy adventures. Sometimes you don't stay in the time period you're supposed to be in. Uh, other times you get to meet people from different time periods that have decided that they would like to vacation in your time period because for whatever reason it's more fun or interesting in the proverbial way and apparently the crew of this ship sent this ship back to protect it from falling into enemy hands and when we received it there wasn't anybody on board. What so, enemy, if you don't mind me asking? Um, uh, one that if I told you that uh, some men in black suits with mind erasers would show up. Um, right. I really should learn from Maddox here. Um, yes. Not to uh, ask those questions. I will say this much as well. My getting to know said men in black with mind erasers um, when I met them and I'm trying to not say what it was, but I was approached and told to pick members of my crew on the original Lysithia. And of course I picked my chief engineer, my second officer Maddox and was immediately told no I told them the rest of the people I wanted to bring with me and once I brought up Maddox I was told no when asked why it didn't make sense at the time now it does but I was told that if he traveled through time one more time he wouldn't be here. That seems consistent to what the medical staff has told me about where he is at. Yeah. Um, I have been warned of the same thing myself, but I don't think I am as far along as he is. And we've gotten very lucky being an Andromeda because of it um if you ever get a chance you can read up on the original the the mission to andromeda that wasn't actually a mission to andromeda if you catch my drift right with the light with the original isithia so point of clarity are you saying that the chronometric radiation is therapeutic for temporal psychosis? Speaking from personal experience, yeah, it's helped a lot. Uh, I will say, though, that um, my wife, who also went with me on that little jaunt and who has been around me and the ship the entire time, apparently her species takes to it a lot better than humans do. She has no symptoms whatsoever and speaking I, of certain wives you get a <sighs> chirp on your communicator go for Beckett 
Hubby, what did I say about leaving your dishes everywhere? Uh, now <laughs> is definitely not the time. I think this is a perfect time. We've been over this six or seven times and you still do it. I'll double tap my comm and turn it off. <laughs> well, um, Admiral, your hospitality Hi. has... Oh. I can't overstate how oh, grateful don't... we are. Uh, I, I understand. Um, and the only reason I did that and incur the wrath of a species of warriors that make Klingons look like puppies is I think that your assessment is a correct one. Uh, I will happily take Matic um, onto the Leviathan. And I do believe that even in his advanced stages of it, that what has helped me will help him. It's, of course, him and Savia's decision, but I hope you understand that this is not what I wanted. He is very valuable to my crew. I consider him a friend, and I might just come and check in on him every so often. Well, I was going to extend the same to you and the problem you were having with the species that can take people over is if you need help, um, if you are in your direst and cannot call upon the other ships that you're in charge of, Commodore, I can literally be anywhere on that side of the galaxy in that quadrant in a matter of minutes. And I will bring hell with me. Well, uh, my, I might have to hold you to that, Admiral. Thank you again. Um, there is one last thing that is very important. All right. And this is in no books. This is in no orders. This is nothing. This is literally a captain talking to a captain. If, for any reason whatsoever, now that you've come through it, you learn of another species that is on your side of that gate, move to the gate or through the gate with a sizable, with a sizable force, you have to destroy it. You cannot think about the people that are on this side even if you're on this side. Of course. And if I have to, then we'll see you in five years. True. And I will show up with a whole bunch of people that are really pissed off and want some short leave. Speaking of pissed off people, materializing just a little bit ways away is a certain wife of a certain admiral holding a certain rifle. <laughs> um... If you need anything else from us, you have 10 seconds, hubby. Yeah, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. She'll back away with her hands up. Bye. She'll wave <laughs> to his wife. Thank you. And as, as maybe a little bit of domestic violence happens, we actually cut to a little bit of ways ahead of that conversation. Um, Cause I think we all know where this is going. Um, and uh, Matic, as you and Savia are going through the corridors, uh, with your things in tow. Uh, before the turbo lift waiting for you is a certain first officer. Commander? Commander. What, uh, what brings you out? I just, um... Wondering how things are with you right now. Um, Matic is going to rub uh, the side of his face. Um, you'll notice that it's red and that uh, the shape and size of the red marks match about the size of his hand. Uh, percussive maintenance works great on machines. He'll give like a sly little smile of like, you know what I mean? 
not so much for the human machine. I, I have have heard. Matic will just smile. Warp. He'll point his heart. Warp core, computer, engines. Fair At enough. the end of the day. Fair enough. A complicated machine, nonetheless. I. At at this point, I assume that everybody knows about what's going going down, right? Okay. I. It is it is with a heavy heart that I say that I I will miss you here on the ship, Matic. Despite the issues that you bring. Me issues never. Have I ever caused issues? And then he'll just kind of look at Savvy and then look back at Rast. Savvy have... just looks at you and says, "We're gonna need like seven pads if you really want me to answer that question." The uh, the good part, Matic, is that you have provided more solutions than you have created issues. So your sum total is positive. Yeah, I always try to make sure that my uh, my solutions have uh, been the things that ended up in paperwork and not my problems. Is there anything that we can do for you here? Mm, make sure that when I'm better that this ship isn't in more than three pieces. Very well. I can almost guarantee that. You know, William's driving and all. Uh, Commander, there's something else that I wanted to uh, give to at least the Commodore, um, but I figure that perhaps going through you and getting your permission will also be acceptable. Um, he's going to hand a pad to Rast on it. It'll be a promotion request for Jensen to Lieutenant Junior Grade and a promotion request for Zeke and then moving him to uh, Chief Transporter Operator. I will I will pass these along with my recommendation as well. I'm sure that I'm sure that the captain will uh, will allow it. I don't see any reason why not. I mean it is Jensen he has done much better than anyone could possibly imagine. He Matic also will... he also is in the positive column, though not as much as you are. Well, I mean, we all got to start somewhere. Fair enough. And uh, uh, Rast will give him a handshake. Which which arm does Rast extend? <laughs> uh, he will extend the non-removed arm. <laughs> so I'm guessing it's uh, he's extending his left arm. Matic will extend out his hand and uh, shake Rast. I've uh I've heard that uh my old friend has some interesting tricks waiting for me on the sh on the uh Leviathan, I believe. Mm -hmm. What uh you wanna happen to uh have any of the protocols for any of those, would you? I'm sorry, I do not. Um Matic kinda lights up a little bit and then uh he just, all right, well, I guess I get to find out for myself then. You you should be comforted to know that there at least aren't any, there does not appear to be any Sean in the area. I don't know if it's because of it being Andromeda or the ship itself, but they're not here at all. And I'll make sure that they don't end up here. Wow. 
I would tell you what to smell for, but I'm not as uh, gifted as the ambassador in that regard. Best wishes to you, Medic. You as well, Commander. I would say some Vulcan type thing, but that's not my style. You think I listen to logic either? <laughs> he laughs a little, slaps uh, Matic on the shoulder, and then walks off. Right as the two groups begin to move away from each other, uh, you maybe get a few feet down the corridor, and then Savia sort of turns and says, Oh, uh, Commander, I did have one thing. Yes. I mean, since I'm transferring ships and all, I figure this is a good time. Uh, let's just say the uh, medical department is taking bets on whether you're getting with Charlotte. Any truth to that? Not that I am aware of. Damn, that means I owe somebody 50 bars of latinum. Thank you, thank you, Commander. We'll see you around, bars? I guess. Bars? Wait, hold on, hold on, Savvy. Bars? We'll, we'll talk about it later, and she starts <laughs> pushing you. <laughs> We'll talk about it later. I'm the one that you you know I'm you know I'm the one to go through for betting right as the to, to, uh, turbo lift doors close. And that's why we yeah I was saying, and that's why we don't Woo! and the doors close. <laughs> so uh, with that taken care of, we are gonna kind of do a little narrative sequence where everybody resolves you know their meetings with people, saying goodbye to maybe new acquaintances on the Leviathan. And eventually, what happens is we sort of see an external shot of the Leviathan. And coming out of the main bay is the Fenrir in all her resplendent glory. And the Fenrir arcs towards the Pandora's Gate, heads on through, and emerges back into the Milky Way. Now, the reason uh, we're doing this is because we need to resolve uh, some hanging plot hooks and perhaps generate some new ones. Um, GM, could yes. I interject for a second? You may certainly interject. Uh, if we can cut back aboard... Uh, the Leviathan to Matic and Savia for just a second. Sure. Um, Matic, your your kit bag or whatever, you find a surprise uh, waiting in there. There is one drained Type 2 phaser power cell oh. with a pad that says, I expect this back. Don't make me come looking for it, Williams. Oh. Oh, that's so you may have two momentum for that heartwarming moment. So. Also, you want to run those promotions by Brie. Oh, he's, that'll, he's, that'll be a that'll be a later thing. Yeah, those are I, just recommendations. I'm just saying, said, at some yeah. point, he's just, just some giving point. the. Uh, it's going to be in a report to her with his with his recommendations and sign off, but her final say, of course. Mm -hmm. The the final scene of the Leviathan is just uh, Beckett lecturing Matic on all the protocols that are anti Matic protocols. He's going <laughs> to need a hell of a lot more pads for that. <laughs> lecturing? No, the answer is just going to be. No, you can't get into the ship. No, you can't get into the ship. If you try, it'll be you versus Sona, and she's going to win. You probably would. All right. Well, uh, I did want to say thank you, Mr. Beckett, for using a uh, doing the cameo moment. You are free to hang around. But that is all I have for Mr. Beckett. But yeah. No. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. I would just say not a problem. Thanks for having me. And with if me leaving the Zoom call, is that going to mess anything up? Nah, I shouldn't mess anything up. All right. All right. So uh, with us all back in the Milky Way, uh, we do have to resolve, uh, as I said, some plot threads. So first things first, we have to go through and determine how successful each of the three ships under Bri Archuleta's command are. And I've thought about how to do this in a way that sort of benefits you guys as players, but also is uh, a way to sort of play to the ship's strength. And what I thought was what we could do is, depending on the type of situation, we would roll a certain number of D20 like a normal roll. So for example, uh, you sent the USS Leif Erikson out to go deal with a subspace shockwave. I would say that that is a science task. So what I would like, and anyone can do this, just announce that you're the one doing it. I would like someone to go into the Leif Erikson sheet, and I would like you to roll me 
a computers and a science. And what I would say is that for this first sort of foray into this, this sort of little bit of homebrew, the difficulty on this is just going to be a two. And we'll say that the ship is rolling two dice to start with like it would for a normal character. So... I can roll it. Okay. And just like a normal roll, you can add momentum. Uh, you can give me threat to get more dice. Um, it's a science ship, isn't it? So, and, and it has a focus. So I'm just going to roll. Oh, ouch. Well, you do need to roll one more, but that is a complication. <laughs> so, sorry, dude. Um... <laughs> First oh. mission, Captain loses all three of her ships. Right. <laughs> that was computers. Computers and science. science. That's what I did. Okay. Okay. So what I would say is that with that complication, and we're going to handle this more narratively because I have to generate on the fly based on complications, um, you get a reply from the captain of the Leif Erikson. If you don't remember, that was uh, that was Vinleth? No, that was I'm T. So you just get a very sort of staticky message report from I'm T that says... Admiral, the situation has been resolved. It will be all in my report later, but we are heading to 8ML7 and the Exorcist Ringworld for repairs. Uh, we took quite a beating on this one. Is that a written report? Uh, it is just a transmitted um, a voice one. So there's kind of like static in the video. And as you look in the background... Um, sort of like on Voyager where we see Janeway's ready room get messed up on occasion. Mm -hmm. Sort of the same thing here where I'm right. in T's backdrop is just a mess. And it's live? Uh, no, it is a pre-recorded message. Okay, cool. So uh, the good news is that for again, for this first task, I'm just going to say that it was a success, but it did come at a cost. So we will change that to a O and we will make it a green O. All right, so up next, okay. I would like somebody else to roll. Uh, we're going to handle the USS Clement with their medical emergency. And the Clement is going to be rolling their comms and their medicine. Again, the difficulty is two, and the ship is rolling two dice by default. And the ship would have a focus. Sorry, you said you're doing it. All right, that's already two successes. Nice. Remember, two dice to for this one. I know it's okay. antithetical, like we. It's not giving me a dice number to roll. It just go straight to uh, focus. Yeah, huh. that's why I rolled twice. <laughs> I guess they updated the sheet then. They didn't used to do that. Um, medicine focus. Yes. Submit. Well, look at that. Another two momentum for you. Damn. Bang. So, nice. Commodore, you get a very smug report from Captain Zian that says, We handled this and solved a few extra problems in the area. We even scared a Fergie away from that living ocean planet you were talking about earlier. So the Clement is available, and that becomes a green O. And then last but not least, we have to deal with a disabled ship uh, near Tholian space. So uh, what we're going to do for that, same sort of thing. The Okita is going to be rolling a weapons and a security. Same thing here. But just to add a little bit of dramatic tension, I am going to spend a little bit of threat to make this a difficulty of three. I'll take that, if that's all right. And I'd like to buy an extra die for that. Okay. One momentum. Good and buy two. This is Vinleth. Okay. So computer security, applicable focus. I'll have to do that three more times. Nice. Did you buy the one dice or the two dice? You bought I'll two. take the two. Okay. Security, focus. And we got one of them back. Yeah, you get one of them back. 
Commodore, you get a report from the Okita that says, uh, we got into a little bit of a scrap with an orb weaver, but we scared them off back across the border, no problem. Uh, we are heading back to Deep Space Daedalus. Uh, do you need us anywhere? If so, just send us a message. Okay. And yeah, that is how we resolved the fleet actions. But now we have to determine where are you as the Fenrir going from your current position? We're going to F1. F1. Okay. So let me just change that to an O so I remember. Warp 8. All right. So. Do, oh, go ahead. Do we want the Clement to join us? I was going to ask for the Okita. Well, no, they're kind of far away. Yeah, um, they're they're going to take a while. Oh, we want the score. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We should we should get them to come with us. All right. So, we'll move the Fenrir and the Clement over. All righty. So, that's that housekeeping done. We are going to cut to where is it? It's here somewhere. Because I thought of this scene while we were doing that whole goodbye for Matic, and I wish I had seen the uh, the message from Williams because I thought an honor guard would have been cool as well. Oh well, things happen. But uh, we cut back to six aft, where a certain hot new couple, quote unquote, is uh, enjoying some time together. And uh, Vassar, uh, I'm just curious at this point, you know, maybe Valerie Archer has done her little trick with the emotions a few times now. Not always happiness. Like maybe you asked, like, I want to experience anger or I want to experience uh, sadness. You know, she's she's giving you unique experiences each time. These experiences have been most interesting to record well i'm glad you're getting something out of them what inspired you to give them to me well you're really the only person i can touch on the ship your hologram you won't die if some of my blood gets on you That is understandable. I still would recommend cleaning your whatever you call it after use, though. The mobile emitter. Yeah, that's the term. It is sterilized uh, every time I reconnect with the ship systems. Good, good, good. Um, do you know what that is? And she points out the the uh, one of the windows, and just drifting by. There's a wet floor sign. Like an old earth style wet floor sign. Just floating by. What? It is literally caught because you are at warp. It is literally caught in your little subspace bubble. It's just sort of hanging there, you know, floating a little bit ways away from the ship. It appears to be some form of ancient earth logogram. Uh, excuse me for a moment. This is Lieutenant Commander Vassar to Transporter Room 2. Would you please uh, lock on to some debris located at coordinates XYZ and transport it directly to 6 aft? Vassar, uh, this is Lieutenant Zero right now. Uh, Zeke and myself are working on the transporters. They are currently out of commission. Um, what is the nature of the debris? Uh, a curious 20th century Earth logogram. I am unable to make a more precise uh, assertion without analysis. Perhaps a tractor beam may facilitate the need. I can see if Jensen and the shuttle bay could utilize one of these shuttle uh, transporters to bring the item aboard you say a old earth look icogram some form of signage right does it seem like it should be there if there were a wet floor in space perhaps and uh, Vassar will route 
an ocular signal to the computer to show him what he is seeing. And yeah, it's standard, you know, yellow wet floor sign with the caution, sort of North American, I think, because there is a difference between uh, European and American wet floor signs, at least as far as I know. Um, so it's more the American style where you've kind of got that guy tripping and it's got a, kind of got that cross across it. Like, hey, don't run across this space kind of a thing. It's what floor sign. I don't know what you want from me. This is interesting to say the least. Its origin is currently unknown to myself as... As far as I am aware, we never used a wet floor sign on the Fenrir. Perhaps it'll be of some study later to figure out the current origin of this signage. That is what I hope. Um, let me know when you are able to bring it aboard. Vassar out. And Archer just sort of looks at you and says, and there is a pause. Why do I get the feeling that this sign is indicative of something? Um, that is a very interesting assertion as well. Williams, get your mind out of the gutter. Data records suggest that the Starship Voyager encountered 20th century debris in space in the Delta Quadrant approximately 35 years ago. Uh, honey, and she takes your head, literally puts it back out the window. Now you're seeing an old 2008 Camaro. It's yellow. It's like Bumblebee from the Transformers movie. I think I got the year right, but it's it's the same style. It's it's the new Camaro, quote unquote. And it's just floating in space, floating on by. Can I run a quick calculation as to any hazard it may pose to a sustainable warp field in that region? Eh, should be fine. Vassar to Lieutenant Commander Lee. Uh, yes, Commander. Would you happen to be able to view out the the aft section of the ship and make a personal observation of the rear of the ship and the warp field? I'm seeing certain antiquated debris. Uh, Lieutenant Zero tells me the transporters are offline, so we are unable to bring it on board the ship for further analysis. Well, I should be able to run a scan on the integrity of the warp field from here, and then I'll make a visual check of any kind of distortion in the subspace flow behind us. Uh, this is antiquated debris. Could you be more specific? And the SAR will route an ocular signal to Lieutenant Commander Lee's position to show him a wet floor sign and a 2008 Camaro. These are ancient uh, earth uh, debris. One is a form of signage. The other was a conveyance. Did we pick them up in the Andromeda Galaxy? That would be highly suspicious. Uh, however, if anybody in the Leviathan has a penchant for 20th century knickknacks, it is possible that uh, they trailed along in our wake as we departed the ship. How did an antiquated and, well, environmentally unfriendly and unsound piece of technology end up floating in the middle of the Andromeda galaxy? For that, we should probably bring them aboard. I will admit that those should probably be in a museum. So yes, let's use the cargo transporters or shuttle transporters. We'll, we'll, we'll bring them in. Um, thank you for bringing this to my attention, Commander. It's always good to have a second opinion, just in case my ocular processors are malfunctioning. Speaking of ocular processors, when you go to turn it off, a basketball floats by, and then a basketball hoop, and then a pair of sneakers.
Oh. <laughs> so much for that stoicism. <laughs> so all of the props from the live action remake of Space Jam are flying by the. Uh... <laughs> yeah, kinda. Let's get those transporters back up line. Um, I'll tap my comm badge. Um, that sounds like a good idea. Crewman Zeketherix? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm a little busy right now. What can I do for you? Um, there's an inordinate amount of debris that Commander Vassar and I would like to take on board the vessel. Um, how long do you think it's going to take you to actually finish off your modifications to the transporters? An amount of debris? Isn't that the Commodore? Debris at your letter? What's she doing outside the ship? And there goes Zeke's promotion. <laughs> Jensen, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, you said some de debris? Yes. There appears to be some sort of antiquated Earth terrestrial vehicle and some other Flotsman Jetsam just caught in our warp field. Can you... Uh, I mean, okay, the, the, the vehicle... Probably we can... We can get a solid lock on that if you just give me some time. What what else is there? There's some sort of spherical object that appears to be made out of a, a derivative of rubber. A, a, a large metallic object with a, a hoop of some kind at the end. And a piece of metal that says wet floor. Wait, wait a minute. Wet floor? That's what it a, reads. You mean a wet floor sign? Is a, this a, something a, common a, in your culture? A, no, no. Commander, this is very important. Is this a vintage wet floor sign circa late 20th, early 21st century? Judging by the chronometric readings from the other debris, yes, I, I think so. Do you have perhaps a visual? Uh, yes, I'll route that to your console. And I will do so. There's a there's a brief pause, and Jensen says, "I, I finally found one. I finally found one. Do you understand, Commander? This is a Biohuracan HSC six thousand. This is this is the premier wet floor sign of early twenty first century construction. The uh, North American continent, specifically, uh, pre war United States." These are extremely rare. This will go great for my collection. We're gonna have to take a look at that collection of yours. Um, can you can you finish your repairs on the transporters as quickly as possible so that we can? I want to say just beam this junk on board and disintegrate it. But junk, junk commander, commander, commander. This is not junk. I mean the 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 spheroid object with. The, the metal ring, I have no idea what that is, but the 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 ground vehicle also no interest. But this sign or this is history. This is human history. This is this is an archaeological find of of, of unprecedented magnitude. Uh, I mean, I wasn't going to go that far, uh, but it's pretty important, I think. I mean, you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe, really would not believe how many times I tried to chase down a lead on one of these only to find that it was nothing more than a common YYA at that 001, like road cone style wet floor sign. Those are a, those are a, a strip platinum a dozen. For very good. I'm going to get on those repairs right away. You're going to, you're going to have transporters back. Right. Right. Give me 10 good. minutes. Great. Give me 10 it's, minutes. I, I hit my comp badge. It's out. <laughs> I apologize, my dear. I believe I will have to meet up with Lieutenant Commander Lee. Yeah. Wait, hold on. Is that? And you look again out the window. And I'm gonna rely, I'm gonna rely on you, Dag, to correct me on this. But uh, isn't the Vulcan weapon that we see Spock and Kirk go at is that a Tonfa? 
I'm trying to remember what it's actually called. I believe you are correct. Well, you see a tonfa, basically a polearm with a crescent moon at the head and then a counterweight at the other end. There's a tonfa. And then there's something else of interest. Uh, A Klingon dagger of some sort. And the more you look out the window, the more you start to see debris from other cultures. It's not just Earth or Vulcan or Klingon. There's a whole lot of debris out here. In fact, by the time you arrive at your destination, it becomes very clear what this is. And I know I'm moving it ahead narratively a little bit, but I think it's appropriate. Because when you arrive, maybe about 10 minutes later, after you're observing all this and reporting all of this, at the coordinates that Archuleta saw in her vision, quote-unquote, there's not a black hole. Instead, it's a white hole, if that makes any sense. It is literally spewing matter at an alarming rate. And as you look out the window at this phenomenon, Archer just says, Are those common here? Uh, Visar will cross-reference his astrometrics index to see if there are any other reports of white holes in uh, the Federation database. As far as I know, Mm. this would be the first one. No, uh, this would be the first reported sighting. Yeah, go do your science thing. This is way more important. That's that's way more important than whatever we're doing here. I take my leave. We still doing dinner later? Of course. Cool. And with that, and... we're going to take our break. So uh, we will be back in 10 minutes. Everybody stick around.
Welcome back, everybody, to part two of uh, Fenrir Season 2, Episode 7, where apparently uh, the crew of the Fenrir has discovered a phenomenon known as a white hole, the opposite of a black hole. And we sort of rejoin our intrepid crew with the Fenrir and the Clement holding a good distance away. And uh, you all are just sort of observing it, either on the bridge in the science lab. Uh, I think most would be on the bridge at this point, but um, if you want to be somewhere else, just let us know. And before you can really start going, what does this mean? What scans am I taking? Uh, the Your yeoman, Commodore, says, um, Ma'am, we're getting a hail from the Clement. Do you want me to put it through here? or On screen is fine. Thank you. And appearing on screen is a uh, very disgruntled looking uh, score. Again, uh, this particular score has robotic-esque wings. They are metallic. And he sort of has his arms crossed, across, or arms crossed and he just sort of shaking his head. And he goes, Commodore, when you, uh, when you asked for my assistance, um, I mean, were you expecting this? Wasn't quite sure what I was expecting, Captain. Hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's cool for the eggheads, but, uh, I mean, it's just throwing crap everywhere. Why, why is this important? Do you have somewhere you'd rather be? I can think of about 17 other places, yes. Oh, well, forward those to me and I'll consider them. But for now, you're here. Hmm. I'll make sure to highlight Ryza. I hear it's nice this time of year. Hmm. I'm sure there's a line. Hmm. And then there's a staring match for a moment, and then the calm cuts off. Oh, he's such a joy. Who's on sensors around here? <laughs> uh, that would be me, Captain. Commander. Yes, Captain. Um, what is this thing out here? <laughs> Please. Well, Captain. She's aggravated uh, taking it on you. Sorry. <laughs> initial sensor scan seems to suggest that it is a particle fountain white hole. Um, I believe it's aggregating material from an alternate universe. The other end of this aperture would be a, a black hole in a, an alternate reality collecting material and then spewing it forth into ours. The exact nature of the means of transmission and, well, what happens to the matter as it is being transmitted is entirely unknown to us. This phenomenon has only been encountered a few times in the history of the Federation. Mm. What is the nature of the material uh, extruding from the fountain? Well, um, it's spectacularly heterogeneous. There are materials from Klingon worlds, Federation worlds, and it seems as if there are a number of pieces from alternate uh, or varied time periods. I have an important question. Who's currently at the helm? Oh, great. I mean, Williams. Who's on first? Who's What's on, on first? second? I don't know who's on third. Would Williams be at the comm? Would Rass be at the comm? Or is it just some red shirt? I... Who's our helmsman? We have one, don't we? Rawls, the Squirpy. Yeah, yeah the she's Squirpy. uh she's on break right now. Mostly because I don't have a good token for her. So, narratively, she's doing something else. It's not her shift, quote unquote. Okay. Jensen. Je I mean, <laughs> if you want Jensen... Uh... Does he have a con of one? He's engineering. <laughs> Let's make it a red shirt and uh, move, move forward. All right. So uh, the red shirt at the comm, uh, sort of his hands begin to dance rapidly across the console. And he starts muttering under his breath. No, 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 uh, I... uh, Rast is going to go over and see what's going on. 
Rast, I'd like you to roll me in uh, in Insight Con, difficulty of three, please. And actually, I would say that the Fenrir could assist you with a Computers in Con. All right, we'll use one of the uh, Momentum. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll grab the Fenrir. Oh. Hmm. Would you like to keep that complication? Or would you like to spend determination in reroll? Hey, yeah, I'm going to spend determination uh, using uh, every problem has a solution. Okay. And that was insight. On. There, that's better. Much better. That is a grand total of four successes, so you actually get the momentum right back. The uh, reason... Three, three successes. Uh Oh, did you mean to re-roll all three? Oh, I guess I didn't have to. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I'll, I'll give it to your benefit. Okay. You get it back. Um, the reason the red shirt is having a panic attack, as it were is because the Fenrir sensors are detecting something truly massive coming through the event horizon of the white hole. And it's important because when I say massive, I don't mean like a universe class. I don't mean like a Tholian dreadnought or a Borg tactical cube. Planet Planet. Planet killer. (laughs) A literal planet the size of Jupiter is coming through the white hole. What? All right, so uh, Rast uh, communicates to Clement, evasive action as quickly as you can. And uh, he's going to uh, he's going to basically shove the guy, uh, the guy out of the seat and sit down. Okay, I need you to do me a daring and a con. Let's make this interesting. I'll spend some threat. I'm going to make this a difficulty of three. Actually, let's make it a difficulty of four. And the complication range will be an 18 to 20. <laughs> the Fenrir will assist you with a engines con. And I also assist. If you tell me how. Um, as there is a massive planet emerging in this immediate area of space, all of the gravity in the area is going to be immediately affected. Mm-hmm. And Vassar will begin immediately routing... Um, calibrations to compensate for the gravity to the Clement and to uh, Fenrir. Okay. And uh, I'm going to spend a momentum. Okay. I might spend three for that, but... What's the roll? Uh, right. For Vassar, let's make that a daring science. Alright, well, there's an assist from the Fenrir. That's good. And you know what? I'm going to uh, I'm going to challenge a value. Ooh, we haven't really done that much. What yeah. are you challenging? Uh, you know what? I'm trying to save Archuleta's ship, so I'm indebted to the captain. Okay. And I'm trying to remember how it works. So you would have to change that to something else at the end of the session. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you no longer feel indebted to the captain... Sure, I would say you could challenge this value. All right. Can I get a focus? Uh, You would have a focus, yes. And so quantum mechanics. All right, well, that's already four successes, so we've already passed. (laughs) And because you assisted Vassar, you can't get rid of that complication. So So that's six uh, successes. Oh, boy. Yeah, so that is six successes, so you do get two momentum. You're welcome. But narratively what happens with Rast at the helm, the Fenrir gets out of the way of this Class J planet coming through the white hole. However, Vassar, when you feed the gravitational data to the Clement, either they don't listen or they receive an incorrect version because they steer into the planet's path. Oh no! 
<laughs> no. Dr. B. It's not. That's not. Your goose is cooked. The goose. Oh my god. (laughs) Well, you didn't like that captain anyway. (laughs) Trying to settle the score. Who are you saying that to? (laughs) You. Yes, I am pushing that planet into reality, Bizarre. Simultaneously steering the other ship into it, too. Mm-hmm. And I would say you guys get one action, now that I can talk without jets flying overhead. Uh, I would say you guys get one action to divert or otherwise stop the Clement from going, you know, ship, planet, poof. Tractor beam? Tractor beam Tractor is an beam. option. Tractor beam. The other option would be to link up the computers and then have their helmsman hopefully pull some magic. Can we also use uh, concussive force from torpedoes to potentially wave them off? I would say yes, but there would be a significant risk of damage to the Clement. It's better than having it destroyed. <laughs> this is true. Uh, deploy the prefix code and have them decompress their ventral base. That would above. shove them, yep. Also, I love that reference All tag. Thank options. you. So which which plan are you guys going to go with here? Because th- those are all different roles. <laughs> uh, my vote's for tractor beam. We could consider this a, a round table call for suggestions that we all just gave to the Commodore who mm-hmm. gets to make the decision. Mm-hmm. Sure, let's what make it that. What are we doing? You have already gotten out of the way of the planet. You are in the clear. I want a tractor beam. You want a tractor beam. All right. Yes. So, Williams, work. this is your time to shine. Don't say that. <laughs> I need you to do me a... You have contr- five momentum. You do have five momentum. I need you to roll me a control security. The ship will assist you with a structure security. Unfortunately, the Clement is not at close range, so the difficulty goes up to a three. I have enough threat, just enough threat remaining, to make it a difficulty of five. What? Um, is there a way that Lieutenant Zero could assist by one of the folks is being propulsion systems? He's able to have the tractor beam while whenever it hits, mm-hmm. parts of it repulse and pull to... Not necessarily fight against the Clements tr- thrusters and propulsions, but basically to have them... steer it. Right. Yeah. Like basically using the tractor beam as a rudder. Right. Um, I would say I would allow it, but I would make the complication range in eighteen to twenty. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna spend uh, three. And minutes what's the Fenrir? assist with uh structure security okay uh what am i rolling you are rolling a daring engineering all right no help from the fenrir and um since the tractor beam technically counts as tactical does my focus for shipboard tactical systems apply here it most definitely would how many deaths are you rolling uh four and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and actually, you know what? Instead of doing that, uh, GM, can I instead use my point of determination to tap my value, measure twice, cut once? Yeah, you certainly uh, could. To double check my calculations before I deploy that tractor beam. All right. Oh, night ops. So we're going to cancel that and do that roll again. I got most of that, but that was a particularly low jet. But I got the gist of what you're doing. Okay. All right. Well, that is already five successes. So all that needs to happen here is zero not rolling a complication. (laughs) Hold on. We've been here before. Fuck up. (laughs) Bearing. That's what got us into this situation (laughs) to begin with. Yes. All right, okay. that is six successes. You get a point of momentum back. So narratively, again, what happens 
is the Fenrir. A cone of blue light emanates out from near one of the structural hard points near the deflector. And it sort of turns the Clement just enough out of the way of the planet that by the time the planet comes sailing past at blinding speed, that the Clement only just clips the outer atmosphere and it still shears off a great chunk of the port side nacelle, but the ship itself does not take the main, you know, planet to the face. Um, and the good news is that after you have pulled and pushed them out of the way, the planet just continues on its merry way, probably to become a rogue planet that somewhere, somewhere down the line will just run across out of nowhere. But your immediate danger has been solved. Commander Lee, can you track that planet for us to make sure that it isn't going to be a threat to anybody in known space? Uh, absolutely, Commander. I'd also like to scan the surface to see if there's anything abnormal about it, um, or if there's anything that might be altering its course. Okay. I would like you to roll me a reason science. The Fenrir will assist you with a sensor science. Difficulty of two. Okay. And I'll use augmented ability uh, reason. Okay. Also, Vassar, you could assist on this if you so wished. GM. Yes. This is the complication I'm going to roll now. <laughs> For players' purposes, how fast is this planet going? Like, is it like let's tens say, of thousands kph? Yeah, let's say thousands? full In impulse. impulse speed. Full oh impulse. God. Whoa. Which wow, I believe six, is... Six hauling ass. I was going to say, which I believe, if I remember correctly, full impulse is 0.3c. So, yeah, that planet's hauling. And what was the ship assisting with? <laughs> and it's a Jupiter size? size? Yep, the it is Jupiter size. Wow. Yeah, is it... It, lo it doesn't look big enough <laughs> to come out of that. So. What's, what's the like, assist? Uh, the assist would be a a reason science for Vassar. And yes, she would have a focus. And here comes the complication. Science? <laughs> yeah, you're darn right. Uh, Going right yeah. for the starbase. Yeah. <laughs> six successes then? Yeah, that is six successes. So I have good news and I have bad news. Which would you guys like first? Bad. Uh, bad. The bad news is that Sometime in the future, Bajor is going to have a rogue planet slamming into it. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, no. But it's like a well, thousand we have years four now, floating so okay. momentum right now, so I that mean, would be we the have good four news. momentum too. That would yeah, be the good news. The good news is it's galactically going to take a while for that to we happen. Have Billions of years. years. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> a lot uh, our, our than of anything else that was going to happen to it. Damn. Vis Vassar is just going to do a basic calculation of a minimum safe distance uh, just in case another class J decides to say hello. The prophets are um, pissed. You know, if you've rolled a complication, they'll handle that. if you had rolled a complication, you know what would have happened? The planet would have gone to warp. <laughs> 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 We're talking about a Class J, not the Fisarius. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> but, Lee, you do have a free question. You are a science officer, so you do get a free question. Yes, with my free question, do I think that it has been artificially propelled, or what do I think is artificially propelled to that speed? Well, it's funny that uh, Dag just made a joke, because now that you're really looking at the sensor scans, that ain't a Class J. That's like a Death Star-sized... Well, Jupiter-sized Death Star that just has a shell of atmosphere, if that makes any sense. Commodore, that is not actually a planet. It's some form of station or ship. <laughs> That's no moon. It's, yeah. <laughs> uh, any idea of... Can you recognize the design? Do we know who this is from? Uh, with the floating momentum, can mm -hmm. I determine? Well, can I determine who built it? You can. You beat me to the punch. You know oh, how in Enterprise that gosh. the uh, sphere builders uh, kind of made an appearance? Actually, no, wait a second. That wasn't Enterprise. That was TNG. The episode was Scotty. 
if I remember no, correctly. No, uh, it was Enterprise. Was it Enterprise? You're talking about the Sphere Builders the or the reason? Dyson Sphere? That's what I'm trying to coordinate in my mind. I mean the ones that the Zindi were allied with. Sphere Builders. Sphere Builders. Okay, that's the one I mean. Which was Enterprise. Which was Enterprise. Okay. Um, but since you are going to spend momentum to answer that question, I will give you more information in that rushing onto the bridge is Ambassador Charlotte, and she she kind of stops and goes, Okay, um, totally can smell it from here. Sean. I was just about to call you, Ambassador. Sorry, uh, other Ambassador, we were chatting girl talk. I, you, I'm sure you understand. <laughs> Recommend we plot an intercept course, Commodore. Do it. And I think we still have two floating momentum. Three. We do. Is Three? It? Okay. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask one more question. Do I, do I detect any kind of weakness that might be exploitable at our level of technology? I have to think hard on this one because I want to make sure I don't kill the tension. Let me put it this way. It is possible in Star Trek, or at least we see on the show, that a tractor beam can be used to literally move a stellar core fragment. And in fact, I think we did something similar in Amalthea where we literally moved a moon using five ships tractor beams. If you had enough ships and you had enough, say, power, power being a nebulous quantity, you could divert this thing into a black hole. But aside from that, until you get a in-depth scan of what is really beneath the surface of this atmosphere, you're not seeing, like, a small porthole that maybe leads to the reactor. So if we send this through a black hole, we'll basically be playing stellar volleyball. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody else will send it back to us, you know. But well, it could just direct it into a sun. You could direct it into a sun. That is an option, though... Again, I'm not an expert in these things, but I think if you throw Jupiter at the sun, does it automatically go red giant or not enough mass? Not enough mass. How close are we to the galactic black hole? Oh, you mean like the one at the center of the universe? Yeah. Uh, if I remember center correctly, of the galaxy. If I remember correctly, you guys are if you're here in the black not and that the, far. The center's up here. I would say it, it is possible to get to the galactic black hole. But the problem is, is that the planet is headed in almost the opposite direction. Mm, okay. We also don't have the firepower now to do that. That is correct. Or the horsepower. Also, we don't want to we don't want to give the god of Shaka Rhea a giant, a giant space station. So. Okay. I mean, he'd appreciate it. I mean, I'm sure you would. But what does God need with a starship? The prophets certainly don't need them. Um, with those last two floating momentum, what I'd like to do is, could I create an advantage in that the gravitic device that we developed to combat the Sean before could alter the gravitational constant of the universe surrounding the planet in order to enable us to move it more easily or with fewer starships? Yeah. yeah, I'd allow it. I would say that the caveat, though, you're going to need a lot of starships to pull this off. More than you've got, conceivably, with your fleet. Um, This is a probably a stupid question. Mm -hmm. If we break the Fenrir into three, does that count as three separate ships, or would the I mean, tractor beam still... Because I remember in Ophion that we did something similar. We also did something similar in Amalthea. Yes, I would say that if you split up the Fenrir, you had a working Clement, you had a working Leif Erikson, you had a working Okita, you might be able to start steering this thing. But as a reminder, the Clement just literally had half its nacelle torn off. 
And also, the bigger problem is the hole itself. Uh, for um, an immediate uh, bandage for the hole would be to deploy a quarantine buoy, uh, telling other ships in the area to avoid this part of space due to uh, erratic debris. Do can Brie like sense, like, or do we already know if it's um, artificially created? The white, the white hole, hole, you mean? Yeah. I would say you're not sure. Do we have any of that red stuff that we can just drop in there? And... Red matter, yeah. The red matter? Red matter, yeah. I mean, you don't have any on the Fenrir, but <laughs> you could go get some from Earth. Or wherever it is they keep it. They don't really tell you where they keep it. If Vassar were to run scans of the object, would he be able to detect uh, life signs or uh, power signatures? Yeah. I would say if you give me a momentum, I will uh, answer that question. Anybody okay with that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Take my momentum, please. There are approximately 50 million life signs on this thing. All of them of varying species, size, intelligence. But what I would say is that based on your abilities thus far in detecting Sean, I'm going to give this to you for free. All of them have Sean in them. The All bad of ones. Them. The bad ones. Well, you're assuming yeah. the bad <clears throat> ones. I mean, it's not like they said, oh, hey, we're just going to fly by with our, you know, Jupiter-sized planet. Which, which And is they don't seem to rest. care about us. No. They're just on their way. Yeah, they're just. So that was. They just lifetime. merged um, onto the highway. <clears throat> uh, there was one more aspect to that <sighs> about um, power signatures. Yes. So good news. You're not detecting any engines. So plus there. It's inertia? It is purely coasting on inertia. It used the black hole to slingshot itself into our galaxy. Commodore, there are 50 million life signs on that object. All of them are shunned. Well, I hope Char I hope Charlotte's hungry. <laughs> Commodore, I'm not gonna be able to eat that much. Uh, she's gonna add, she's gonna open a um, channel to the Clement and ask for a report. So appearing on screen is still in that sort of arms cross pose, but now like there's a beam falling in the background and there's a little fire going on. Someone's trying to put it out behind him, and he goes. Commodore, why? You should be thanking me. But if you'd just gone here to begin with, we wouldn't be dealing with this problem. We're not done with the problem yet. Oh, I know. So... But we have problems over here on the Clement. My chief engineer tells me best we can do is warp one in two weeks. In two weeks? As in, yes, I, I will break it down well, so you may okay. understand. I mean that we are without warp travel oh for another two weeks. <laughs> okay, well, I was going to tractor beam you to where we were going, but you can figure that out. Um, he cuts off the call. Yeah, we're going to leave them. They're a medical ship. They'll be fine. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with this white hole. Um, Quick question. Mm -hmm. Regarding the uh, path and, I guess, any sort of residual anomalous readings that the uh, Class J would have left, mm -hmm. is it possible to tell if there have been others that passed through before this one? Give me a momentum, I will answer that question. Everyone okay with that? Yep. I'm there you go. Speak for everybody. This is planet number three. 
Ah, why did I know that that was, that, that was going to happen? See, when we said we wanted the bad news first, this would have been the, the bad news first. What's the good news? Yeah. It's going to hit Bajor in a thousand years. That's the good news. The Cardiaceans no longer have to worry about wasting soldiers. Oh. 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 oh my God. We're just all over oh. the place with the, the, the birds just, tonight. Just, 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 God. This is extremely weird. Just, I don't even know how to go yes. about this. <laughs> Like um, the... <laughs> the so the other two planets, can we determine what directions they took off in? One's I going to Earth. Me. Fuck. Another's going to. Hold on, I'm trying to find out in my notes. Uh, I'm trying to. Apparently, I didn't make a note. Uh, is it New Romulus that they have in Star Trek Online? It's because yeah. Hobus has happened already. The you mean the place of the Romulan Republic holds the seat of government? Yes, that's what I mean. Romulus. So basically, you've got a planet headed toward Bajor. Bajor. You've got a planet headed towards Earth, and you've got one headed towards what remains of the Romulan government. Captain, this is Lieutenant Zero. Go ahead. Seeing as the Clements chief engineer has, for some reason, been very forceful in ensuring him and his crew can take care of their engineering issues, um, hubris of organics, I guess, the current status of the now three present orbs or planets that are traveling would it be imperative to possibly try to send messages to Starfleet Command and New Romulus, perhaps even Bajor and the Cardassian Empire? Uh, it would be easy for me to include a diagnostical plan on how to adjust ships to be able to perform uh, Lieutenant Commander Lee's gravitational beam that could assist in removing of the or stopping of the planets. Even though at this time, I'm unaware if used utilization of that beam will have a same effect that it did on the uh, Akita's original crew whenever they were taken over. I think in this case, it's a good idea to send that. So I'll make it so. Captain, we might also think about splitting the ship and having one section of the Fenrir following each of these rogue planetoids. Would we'll split the party? Yeah, that would definitely split the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to do it. Yeah. We just got this ship back together, Lee. <laughs> yeah, it is at your discretion, Captain. Um may be able to apply a low-level warp field uh, to reduce the mass of the planetoid as well. Well, in theory, something that we could do is that if we were able to break atmosphere and quote-unquote land on the planet, we could take out bits of it by generating a small warp field and basically the same as just shearing of a ship whenever it goes to warp but not all of it does now there's 50 million life forms on board correct which is something that would have to be taken to account the other issue is is when it comes down to it those 50 million life forms are shone they're also varying levels if we happen to be able to find that the f top three miles of the planet that we could remove are essentially cows or other forms of livestock. That's three less miles of a planet we have to worry about moving. You're also talking about weapons of war. Those are troop carriers. And I also think we need to take into consideration the fact that they don't belong in this universe in the first place. Do the Undine have a 
I know that the Undine have had dealings with the Shun before. Do they per possibly have a way to deal with these tro troop carriers, as Commander Rest put, put it? Well, all it takes is a chirp on a communicator to get a hold of uh, Miss Archer, and she says, Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can... Uh, I think I have a solution that'd work, but it's gonna mean a lot of ships, and I mean a lot of ships. Um. Well, as I recall, Ambassador, I believe nine or ten of your vessels were capable of destroying a planet. I mean, you're not wrong, but I meant more on your end. Once it's in fluidic space, we can take care of it, no problem. It's getting it there, that's the issue. Right. You did request that we close any openings into fluidic space. Yes, and I say this not as an affront, just to remind you of the situation. Uh, Boothby and I, we are simply a sect of the Undine. We don't represent... All Undine, which means if you open up a big enough hole into fluidic space to let in these planets, you would basically be declaring war on all the other Undine. Does it? Does this strategy require the planet to be in fluidic space, or can you bring some of your ships here? We could potentially bring ships here. And again, I myself am confident in saying we don't have a problem eliminating Sean, but my understanding is that you Starfleet types would take great issue with that many lives lost. We're just uh, pl planning, you know, just in case. Well, just so it is on record, yes, there is a way we could get the Undine involved. It would be a messy scenario, but it is on the table. Thank you. And it's right about then, to make Commodore Archuleta's life even worse, there's a flash of light. And a certain figure, which we all know and love, John Delancey, in his resplendent glory as Q, Ooh. just is sort of lounging on the view screen, you know, kind of leaned back, hand on his chin, and he says... I leave you humans for who cares how long, and you do this. Why? John Luke never did this. No, 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 no. It wasn't you. We had a different cue. Why are you here? Well, because humanity's in danger. You seem awfully concerned. Oh, no, no, I don't want to be here. I mean, you've got a Zanetta board. I don't want to deal with that. Lieutenant Isha. Oh, what? God, don't tell me her name. Are you, you implying get... that a Federation member species is actually capable of posing a threat to a Q? Oh, look, it's a Bajoran. Tell me, have the Prophet spoken to you lately? Wait, 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 I've got this one. He snaps his fingers, and around everybody, there's just a white void, and he is literally some figure from Lee's past, and he says, Oh, Watch. you must listen to us. We are the Prophets. And then he snaps his fingers, and things return to his normal. <laughs> you know, blasphemy is a sin, even for a Q. I'm shaking. Hmm. So, Commodore, how are you going to fix this problem? Are you going to do doom 150 million lives to save your own? Or do you have a better idea? I'm all ears. Well, technically, I am not dooming them. The Sean already did that. Your mental gymnastics are hazy at best. Yeah, you're Maybe. right. Captain. Are you implying there's a way to save them? Well, if I told you everything, why am I even here? To snap your fingers and help me out? <laughs> no. You're not John Luke. I don't care about you. 
I care about humanity, not you. Which is weird because you are human, but yeah. Um, well, we'll have to figure it out like we always do. I don't, I mean, the sheer mass of the amount of people, we don't have any technology to remove them. Remove the Sean. Well, if that's how you're thinking, I'll just watch from a distance. Snaps his fingers, things return to normal. Hmm. Perhaps there is a diplomatic solution, Commodore. Yeah, the we Shen do not know real diplomatic so far. We do not know if these Shan are of the enemy or allied sect. We know they're bad. Well, we do have a possibility. You want to get all jacked up on Silas Island again? No. I believe that uh, we can steer the uh, the Sean-infested vehicle towards Pandora's Gate. And that we would did accomplish... not sense We did not sense any Sean in Andromeda. It might be native to Andromeda that they can't go there. But it also may be something specific with the ship. It's worth a try for at least one of them. Current Starfleet directives state that Pandora's Gate is considered a secret project, and even then, the thought of stranding, stranding, strand, stranding, stranding. Your Android <laughs> is malfunctioning. <laughs> <I can't>. Stranding. <laughs> Zero. Stranding. Stranding the Leviathan along with Admiral Beckett's. That. Granted, they would be able to return relatively quickly, but as of this time, full directives state that it would be unable to, that that would be a very improper decision. It's also the size of Jupiter, and you can't get that through Pandora's gate. It's very small compared to what it used to be. Um, no, Additionally, so much, there are 50, so much... albeit broken, planet killers on the other side of that gate and if this comes back towards us in five years time and they have planet killers that's not an option maybe there's an easier way to do this in terms of determining whether or not these are the hostile or allied shan wait don't we know that out of character didn't we know that oh i thought we didn't like I i'm asking out know. of character Just yeah i we thought know. we you do Okay. Well, so they, are, do, they are the bad. Okay. Yeah, we know so, they're cool. bad. Never mind. What, whatever yeah, happened to the good Sean that we had on our ship already? Did they leave, or what's what's going on with the? Because Martinez we had what? and the other guy I don't remember the name of. The yeah, Russian. we had the two. Then we had like three on the Akita. Right. So the Akita ones stayed with the Akita. Your two stayed on board. They haven't reported in, but you're probably sure they're freaking out having panic attacks because 50 million enemy Sean and they're trying to not get into the hive mind. So we have one of these Jupiter size 50 million people things headed towards Earth. Towards Earth. Towards Earth. Earth. Bajor. Bajor it's going to take a while. And new Romulus. And new Romulus. Mm -hmm. And it takes a fleet of ships to destroy one of them. Well, if you use the Undine, it takes about nine. So we do we know about what time the they will each arrive at the destination? I'm assuming their goal is to continue to colonize and... Assimilate well, and again, that's the good news is because they don't actually have engines, they're at the mercy of, well, time. Uh, oh, okay. So, so this... we didn't detect these other planets that came out of here. Like, how long ago did they leave the white hole? Well, now that you check, one left about a week ago, 
and another week before that. So about the time you spent in the Andromeda Galaxy. Okay. So basically what I'm implying is had you come here first, you probably could have stopped all of this. Captain, this is a suggestion. Seeing as they've been coming out at a weekly raid, should we perhaps leave the Clement here while they repair, but also could inform us of other planetoids coming through? Yes, I think that's prudent since they can't work <laughs> and they need to repair. Just would to actually, make sure they're at a safe distance. I would actually suggest we go one step further than that, Captain. I suggest we attempt to collapse the white hole to prevent anything further from coming through. Who knows? Uh, they could have the, another hundred planets exactly like those waiting to be slung shot through the white hole. As the science, as a science officer, do you have suggestions on how to do that? Well, a white hole is a particle fountain. We could attempt to use a deflector dish to invert the particle flow. It would almost cause the white hole to collapse in on itself. If we took a certain series of uh, scans of its unique frequency, we might be able to attune the deflector dish to such an effect. Do you believe that Clement has the ability to do that or would we need to stay and help? If it weren't so heavily damaged, I imagine so. But given that they won't even have warp power back for another two weeks, I doubt that they'd be able to muster the well, the power necessary to actually use a controlled deflector pulse to close an aperture of that size. Uh, Commander Fassar, Mr. Zero, any perspectives on this matter? An anti-phase conjugate graviton beam could theoretically collapse the white hole. We would also need to get signatures of the currently floating debris to establish uh, at what resonance the particles are coming out of the hole at. So that way we know at what inverse frequency to place our disrupt our beam at. <laughs> and mechanically, what I would say is that attempting this beam is something you could do. However, it would be difficulty five. The complication range would be max. You would have either Vassar, Zero, Tobin doing the main role. It would be a daring engineering or daring science, depending on you know what uniform you're wearing. You could have one other person assist you. And then the Fenrir would be assisting with a computers and a science. So the Leviathan can't fit through Pandora's gate, can it? It cannot, no. Okay. I thought it could go into uh, Wax and Cause, AM. Because I thought he said that they could be here if we needed them. I think he was more implying that with the flotilla of ships that supports the Leviathan, like the Akagi F, the Adiona B, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, he could get a ship small enough through the pandora's gate to you he just couldn't bring the leviathan to you okay um would the leviathan have anything upgrade wise that could assist us that maybe we would have had access to at some point like i would say somebody has already brought something. that up at the beginning of the session and that's the only hand i'm going to give you the coax drive? Mm-hmm. Oh, you want us to shotgun the white hole. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well I mean if all this fails, we can just go into the white hole and see what come what where we come out. Isn't the isn't it a one way? Theoretically a white hole cannot be entered. Just mm. like a black hole cannot be exited. Mm-hmm. Well, the very existence of a white hole seems to disprove that theory, so. Wait, what? A black hole can't be can't be exited, a white hole can't be entered. However, you have to enter a black hole to exit a white hole. Mm -hmm. no. So wouldn't that make them... You, you have to enter a black hole to exit a white hole. You can't leave that. They're like, it's like a cylinder. 
X and in the middle, only. math is like flipping mm -hmm. you the finger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, relativity. Well, the Starship Voyager also disproved that by cracking the event horizon like a... Oh my the... god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of that Chinese finger trap data ad. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm. can't... That was an episode. Uh, um, okay. Um, just a question out of character. Um, mm -hmm. The sector map that you made for this game, Yes. each, each sector is 20 light years? Let's take a look, actually. 15. Each one is 15. And at one third, uh, one third light speed, it would take 45 years to cross uh, just one sector. So if it's been a week, they should only be oh damn. One week, they should still be within range of the system. They are. Cardassians. They're our allies, for now at least. I mean, we could send a signal to Deep Space Nine. They might be able to uh, come up with um, a if, deterrent for their well, for the one heading in their direction. If, if you're looking is. at the route it has to go, it has to pass by Cardassia Prime. I'm sure the Cardassians would prefer to not lose their capital. I'm sure that could also be a good speaking point to the current. The intent behind my suggestion is that we may not be alone in planning the deterrent. We might be able to summon Starfleet and other nations to assist. Right. The, I think our biggest advantage is that they don't have engines. So once they stop, they can't go anywhere. That is if there's anything that wasn't missed by these scans how do we know that they weren't designed to go towards their targets stop be be stopped at some point and then everybody and then all the inhabitants happen to be transported or in some other way taken out of the planetoid and placed onto their target or onto a nearby target. Who conducted the scans? Tobin did. And Tobin, you feel pretty confident that you didn't detect anything of that nature. I don't think that would be the case, Captain. Although, I must admit, I am somewhat concerned about the Shan's presence in our galaxy, even if we manage to stop the planets without destroying them. The Shan are subspace life forms. Who knows what they're capable of now that they're in our reality? They might be able to find some way individually as members of their species to transport themselves through subspace. And there are 150 million of them if we take the population numbers from this third one and apply them to the other two. Uh, what if Pissar we found like a to... planet to just give them and they can just have that? Depends on what their intent is. Seeing as how previously we've understood the Shan to want to possess uh, life in this galaxy, uh, we may not be able to satisfy them with a planet of their own. Well, it's 150 million versus the rest of the galaxy that we know of so that is if other places have not been compromised yet and since this is the only known white hole there may be other places off of the federation map where these intrusions are occurring however i feel it necessary to point out that we should stick with the variables that we know of and not lose ourselves in speculation We could contact 257 or Starbase 257, the Cardassians and Deep Space Nine. And then from there, we could we could even push it into the Badlands to see if that would disrupt it somehow. Um, if that so is unable to. What's the to, Badlands can, again? The Badlands. 
it's a region of space in which the Maquis operated to hide their maneuvers from the Cardassians and the Federation. Oh, right, right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's basically uh, one big plasma storm. I would like to conduct an astrometric analysis to search the vectors for gravitational anomalies that we might be able to use to our advantage, Captain. Okay. I will be in astrometrics. Is there a way to, since they're subspace creatures, a way to send them back? Well, you the, do what, know well, of one. We had the the gravity. That's what you're talking about, right? Yes, the gravitic beam emitter from the uh, deflector dish that we used on the Okita. I'm not sure if there's a sufficient power on board this vessel to envelop an entire planet or even the major population centers. And I would remind you, Captain, about the effects of that device. Yes. It's not lost on me. It would be no different than killing them. Perhaps worse. Um, just, sorry, I just had a character. Mm -hmm. Guys, didn't we use the Shan's innate photosensitivity to expel them from our own possessed crew members? On a small scale. Yeah, on a small scale. But yes. Okay. I'm just not sure how we would... So, are they... That to a Jupiter-sized... Are they inside the mm. planetoid, or are they on the outside of it living as if it, everything's normal? No, they're in the inside. Do we have any way to penetrate its outer shell to, to understand sort of maybe the internal layout of it? Is it comprised of decks or, or is it sort of built like a, a Dyson sphere with them sort of walking along the edge? I would say based on the scans you've gotten so far, it is sort of like a mini Dyson sphere in that they are mostly hollow in the middle and that they are on the interior surface where they have cities, whatever kind of a thing. We may be able to modify uh, sufficient quantities of photon torpedoes to, instead of being a destructive warhead, emit um, radiation similar to highly luminous or highly luminescent stars. That may impact a significant portion of the population inside those spheres if they are hollow. And if I'm remembering correctly, using the photosynthesis method did not harm the infected. That is by our reports. It, it was just reports, the gravitic just... beam. Mm -hmm. Our reports the photo photosensitivity method was just extremely uncomfortable. The issue with the utilization of the torpedoes would be if we cause issue to if we cause enough damage to the shell of the planetoid or even destroy parts of the atmosphere, there's a possibility that we may space entire populations. We don't have to detonate the torpedoes. We can utilize them similar to the photonic flares. Uh, used by the USS Voyager in the Delta Quadrant. Uh, I believe that we could do this reasonably safely. Would it be enough? Free. Well, that's the question. Well, we have a lot of problems on the table, and we have a lot of potential solutions. But to kind of redirect our focus for a moment, what are you doing about the White Hole? Are you leaving the Clement to deal with it, or are you dealing it with yourself? Given that of an advantage we have is time, mm -hmm. I would like to assist in closing that. Okay. Then, since we are sort of getting around that time, we'll handle it narratively and say that it will take you a narrative amount of time. I'll decide, you know, in the next week, but you can get the White Hole closed. But that's still going to mean you got to deal with the planets. Right. Yeah. So why don't we stop there? Because I think, again, there's a lot of moving pieces you guys have to talk about. 
Um, and it is a monumental problem, as it were. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where we're going to end the session. Um, what'd you guys think? I mean, I know I literally threw planets at you, but... <laughs> you can't keep a good hologram down. <laughs> I just... There's so much to think about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was sort of my goal was I was trying to come up with like a good like season clincher. And it was like, why don't I just make these really big troop carriers that are the size of a planet and just throw a few of those around? When they said soon, they meant like we did this yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll come to a solution. Might not save everyone, but. No, yeah, that's. Half the fun yes. of the game is figuring out how to try and save everyone. But yeah, that's where I'm at in the stream. Uh, Twitch, YouTube, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see where the uh, crew of the Fenrir takes this problem. See you later, stream. Live long and prosper. <laughs>